to introduce uh, Dr. Cornell Murray from IBM CJ Watson. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Murray did, uh, got his PhD from Northwestern, I understand. Uh, uh, so, um, and uh, he has been at IBM for quite some time. And uh, he has won uh, several IBM research awards. And uh, um, uh, today he will tell us some of the work on investigating the mechanics of next generation of nanoelectrons. Let's thank our speaker. Well, thanks very much and good afternoon. I'd like to just sum it Okay. So good afternoon. Uh, thanks again. Uh, it's right after lunch, so uh, I'll try to keep everyone awake, uh, including myself, uh, for this talk. But I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me there. It's my first trip to Hong Kong. It's a wonderful city. I hope to get to see more of it. Uh, and I'd also like to thank them for scheduling uh, Professor Lundrum's uh, talk. Uh, right before mine, because he gave a wonderful introduction into and a review of the history uh, of the semiconductor industry. And uh, I'll take a slightly different tack on some of those aspects, but you'll see the synergies that exist uh, between them. And most notably, I'll be discussing more about how mechanics uh, are really an important aspect of controlling uh, semiconductor device operation uh, it has been that case and will continue to be the case. So before I, I start my presentation, I would like to thank uh, my colleagues uh, who have helped uh, with this uh, with the work that I'll show. Uh, they exist both at the Watson Research uh, Laboratory uh, as well as the microelectronics fabrication facility that exists about 20 miles or so north of the uh, Watson Research Center. And I'll show some examples too in terms of how we are able to detect uh, mechanics of these types of structures uh, that were uh, undertaken at Argonne National Laboratory. And there are various uh, funding agencies associated with that work as well. Okay, so in preparing for this uh, lecture, I, I learned uh, that the centennial of Hong Kong University was not too long ago. And in fact, the, uh, the seal was conferred uh, 100 years ago. Uh, and uh, these were auspicious times, of course, uh, in, in science. Uh, there was really much uh, discovery going on. And one particular aspect that, uh, that I follow uh, is the fact that it was uh, about that time, the same time frame that the first diffraction from a crystal was undertaken uh, using x-rays. And here's just a, a, a snapshot of, of the setup. In fact, the X-ray tube exists here. You can see the discoloration that exists there from the, the X-rays that are being produced. Uh, and uh, this was really, uh, if you look at the context in which this work uh, was developed, it was the fact that uh, this, was, this was something that was uh, fairly controversial. And uh, there was by no means an accepted concept that you could actually get diffraction from crystals. And, Anyone now who uh, takes a material science course as an undergraduate will, will uh, probably come across uh, an X-ray diffraction experiment. But there were many naysayers. Uh, and uh, one of the examples you might see was really from the first successful diffraction photograph uh, that, that's shown here in the bottom. And it was the fact that people felt that the thermal vibrations that would come from these atoms in their periodic positions would overwhelm any diffraction signal that you would be getting uh, from, from that information. And if you saw that picture, you might agree, well, yes, there's some serious aspects there that had to be taken into consideration. If you then look at, at the next set of experiments that was done, so these were done with copper sulfate crystals. And if you look at a, an example from a zinc blend crystal, where it's actually the quality of the crystal produced a much finer pattern. And it had to do, actually, with the original assumption that we had on how diffraction occurred. And it was thought to be due to the fact that you would actually get resonance or emanation of radiation from these, uh, from these atoms, rather than the actual periodicity of the system that was driving it. And so that uh, showed their, their choice in a very high Z material, such as copper sulfate, was used for this, even though the quality of the diffraction patterns clearly were, were limited. And it 
that was due partially to the fact that Lowy was um, one of the big names, of course, in quantum mechanics. And so the idea of resonance uh, of, these, uh, of these quantities was something that, that he was focusing on. But it is good that uh, essentially he had both the wisdom and the virtue to continue this work uh, and come to the solution that provided him the Nobel Prize uh, two years later. Uh, in, in addition to the work that uh, the Bragg duo, the father-son duo, uh, and it's the younger of the two uh, that actually produced the law that bears his name that we all know very well. Okay, so no history uh, of uh, this area would be complete, of course, without uh, mentioning uh, IBM's place. Uh, and, uh, and actually, it's, it's, uh, it's antecedent the computing and tabulating recording uh, company was founded also at the same time. And uh, in, in Dayton, Ohio, you can see right there, and that became uh, International Business Machines. But what's interesting about this picture, there are a couple things that I'll, that I'll mention, uh, but it's the fact that uh, not only computing and recording were an essential part of information technology, so this really helps to define the information age that exists also in this time frame. But it's the fact that you can see here that there are certain, if you can see here, uh, that there are certain uh, machines that are here, such as scales and weights. And those really emphasize a different aspect, too, that what was important was the measurement of these quantities, because that really impacted the bottom line, whether or not you were off on a certain product or the amount of that product, and that would affect the profit that you might get from that. And so it's not only the fact of handling the information, but being able to measure it uh, was a key aspect. And uh, as, as uh, was shown by Gabriel earlier today, the punch card uh, was the medium by which this information would be stored. And actually, let me, let me go back uh, uh, to this picture here. So you can see written here uh, the fact on this truck that, that these, this truck was carrying money-making machines. And uh, you know, unless you're you're in the treasury, uh, uh, that's that's something that's not quite or, or, or other less scrupulous uh, activities, um, whether or not that, that's legitimate. What but was first what is the thing that they made money on? so they made money uh, on uh, so there are various uh, basically the weights and, and uh, the uh, the top the, the essentially computer computing type technologies that were available to look at those aspects. And then uh, that clearly uh, evolved. But it was the fact that uh, this is basically the punchline of a joke within IBM. When people ask, what does IBM make? And the joke is, it makes money, of course. And, 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 uh, and a, but, but at any rate, it's the fact that, and I go back to this again, that, that it's this confluence with the measurement of that information as important and as profitable in some cases as the, uh, as the handling and analysis of that information. Okay, so what's really happened, of course, uh, during that period of time is uh, to uh, come up with a way to accelerate the processing and storing that information. And we've had uh, two great talks uh, this morning that really uh, highlighted uh, how that evolved and, and the fact that the scaling laws that existed are still continuing. Uh, and within even basically my lifespan, that we've seen uh, lithographic scaling to take us um, uh, basically a factor of 400, more than 400, in terms of the structures. And so the very first uh, uh, integrated chip microprocessor featured 10 micron uh, technology. So it, uh, it unfortunately it predates uh, <laughs> Professor Lundstrom by one generation or so. Uh, but since then, we, so right now we're processing the 22 te uh, nanometer technology node. And so it's very hard for the human brain to, to comprehend exponential growth. And, and we use these curves to, to help us deal with that. But it's the fact that, that we go huge orders of magnitude between the number of chips that, that existed then to what we have greater than 2 billion uh, chips today. But if you can think of, uh, so what I show here on the bottom right is a cross-section, uh, which is in, in color, even though uh, electrons uh, aren't uh, necessarily in color. But they show the source and the drain regions for a typical uh, device. 
and the channel sits right here. The gates uh, that control that device uh, reside here in these spots. And you can see basically at this length scale of the device that a comparable uh, uh, length scale for the original uh, values would basically be about the width of a football field. So it, it is incredible uh, a growth that has developed our ability to, and continues to be so, uh, to scale the dimensions of these devices. Now, of course, uh, you've seen the examples of computing power and the fact that really it is ubiquitous, that we carry on us gigabytes, tens of gigabytes of, of processing and, and memory. Uh, and the, there is always a need for making it faster, making it smaller, uh, but also making it more efficient. And uh, we're, the comment was made, in fact, uh, today that we have already reached the end of Moore's Law because lithographic scaling itself uh, does not uh, equate to uh, the, the changes that have been observed. And in fact, that partially is true because we have had to incorporate, to maintain the computing that we need, uh, different types of materials uh, and different designs. And that's been because of some fundamental aspects, some fundamental physical limits. One that was touched on before is the fact that the oxide that exists in the insulator between the gate region and, and the channel region is something that is now uh, reaching single nanometer or so sizes. And to the point where you have individual atoms that uh, would, would have to provide the necessary uh, insulation. And that just wasn't, wasn't going to happen. And so in order to uh, reduce the amount of leakage that exists here, we had to incorporate different types of materials. And these are the so-called high-K dielectric materials that have replaced silicon dioxide in many, in many transistors. But the other aspect, too, is we have to look at how to, for the same power, uh, how can we increase the, the speed of our transistors. And it's the fact that um, frequency has started to level off. And that's been the case for several years now. Um, there's no fundamental reason to limit the, the frequency other than the fact that the power density that's required to place us in the values that we're seeing today close to the, the, uh, the face of the sun. And so there are other ways in which we can get around that. One of the aspects uh, is the fact that strain was recognized very early on, actually, in the development of the transistor as a method to change the carrier mobility. And uh, the, 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 the actual quantity or, or the, the mode in which this has happened is called piezo resistance. And it's observed in many different materials. Uh, some of the first work was in group four semiconductor materials, but clearly it's not limited to that. And so the fact that then if we have to understand how the mechanics of these structures, and so what I'm showing here in the bottom right is a cross section where the dielectric insulation uh, has been delayered. And so you can see the overlying metallization that provides power uh, down to the silicon channel regions there. The fact that you can see that this is a composite structure and that interfaces are everywhere. And so all of these actually do impact uh, the mechanics that, that happen at these, at these scales. And so we have to see how edge effects uh, and how the layout, the, the actual physical structure of these, uh, of these devices, impact those mechanics. And what you'll see here, you, you'll note that I, that I left off uh, uh, a length scale here. And that was done intentionally uh, because uh, without that knowledge, you may just want to take these structures and put them into some structural model, find an element model, for instance. Uh, and that might provide you uh, a metric as to the response of these, of these features. And the question that was posed very well uh, by Professor Lundstrom earlier is the fact that uh, we have these black box techniques that have existed to allow us to, to look at, at, these, at these questions. And we have to know, though, uh, what's going on within that black box. And, and my hope through, by giving this talk, uh, that I'll be showing some of the mechanics aspects of how we can make this black box a little more transparent and understand the assumptions and limitations that exist in the models, both analytical as well as numerical, that have been used uh, to, this, to this end. 
And so in the outline, I, I provided a, a bit of a history. I'll, I'll uh, extend this a bit further uh, in terms of uh, the development of the transistor. Uh, but I will then focus on how the mechanical response and the device performance are linked within semiconductor materials. Uh, I'll then go on to how we actually model uh, those types of features. And as I said, they, they can be broken down into a couple of different ways of doing it. But even within the analytical solutions, there are uh, different uh, aspects that are there. And again, this hopefully this will reinforce the point that analytical solutions do exist. Uh, and in, in certain cases, they are as relevant in terms of predicting the response that we would expect to see as anything that we get from these other numerical approaches. Now after that, I'll, I'll take a shift to uh, a different area, one in which we actually look critically at how we can measure the strain that's within these materials. And right now, basically, one will measure a device, see a response, perhaps change the strain within that device, and then say, okay, this, this therefore is strained in a certain way. But clearly, that's a huge convolution of both the transport as well as the mechanics of the system. And so we really do need ways to independently assess what's going on at the device level. And so there are four different techniques that I'll go through. It's clearly not an exhaustive list, but one at least that shows primary ways in which within the semiconductor industry, and even in certain cases on the manufacturing floor, we can assess some of this, uh, uh, this information. And then I'll finish up by talking about uh, a subject that has been touched on so far, uh, where we see things going uh, as we shed this planar CMOS uh, platform uh, to one that involves three dimensions and looks at different types of materials and structures. Okay, so uh, again, you'll recognize this, this photograph, uh, and it shows the uh, replica of the, the first transistor. Uh, it was called a, a point contact a point contact transistor uh, in, in Bardeen's uh, paper back uh, in 1948. Uh, what's interesting, a couple of things that are interesting. First off, uh, he decided not to call this a field effect transistor. And that was partly due to the fact that there are patents already issued in the 20s by people to that type of device, to the description of that device, even though nothing had been produced uh, to, to, uh, to uh, create. So this was really the first working aspect uh, of, that, of that invention. And, and nevertheless, uh, the, uh, the industry has developed into one that recognizes that as the important concept. And basically it's the fact that, again, with this, this uh, semiconducting block here, uh, that a, a signal is provided uh, in the emitter region, and then that signal is amplified uh, on the collector side, uh, and, uh, and so that it is referred to as a triode. And, uh, and since then, uh, and really actually around that time frame too, uh, deformation was understood to impact the performance uh, that exists uh, within these types of structures. And what I'm showing here is, a, is a, an image that was taken from uh, Bardeen's paper in 1950, which first touched on these aspects. And, and clearly it's qualitative because it's a reference to uh, another group for semiconductor. But it shows the fact that the, the atomic spacing clearly impacts the energy bands and the arrangements of them to the point where if you get very far away, of course, then you, you, the, the, uh, there's only one or uh, the, the quantum states are, are well defined. And it's this uh, incorporation of the lattice that actually causes uh, the changes and the, the shifts within the, the energy, uh, within the energy gaps. And so uh, the ideas were, were were established that band gap and uh, and even things like effective mass were touched on uh, this early. And the fact that you can change the effective velocity of these carriers uh, by 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 changing the the, uh, the structure that's here. And the fact that uh, one of the really first steps was just looking at the changes in what's called dilatation or hydrostatic stress strain, what we also call normal stress strain. Uh, but uh, with uh, this paper, he actually, uh, Bardeen and Shockley, did develop it uh, past that to, to incorporate the effects of non-hydrostatic strain in ones that uh, are basically like an electrostatic potential change. And so 
the Hamiltonian then takes this perturbative term that's on there and then can incorporate this to, to lead to basically a shift uh, in the effective mass of these materials. So uh, the first experimental work uh, that existed uh, that uh, you can find also came from Bell Labs uh, and involved uh, the work of germanium and silicon. And what's interesting is that silicon was considered a footnote. It was also considered that way in the, in the previous where, where the work was clearly done in germanium, and then there's a one sentence that says, silicon, we'll see this as well, and, and that was the extent of it. But it was the fact that silicon ended up proving to be a superior material for a couple of reasons that are really due to the processing. Uh, the first is, is the fact that silicon has a, a very, very nice oxide. Uh, that passivates, but also is, is not water soluble as compared to germanium. So that was one of the key aspects that led to its development. Uh, the other aspect is as these materials were being designed for certain applications, uh, the high temperature uh, performance of germanium was inferior uh, to that that, uh, that silicon possessed. So those were the two aspects that really helped to drive the industry to the multi, the tens of billions of dollars that we have invested in silicon research. Uh, and so one of the things that, that actually did change with this paper was the understanding of how to describe uh, the effects of uh, piezo resistance. And unfortunately, it's, it's sort of a sad turn that only recently has started to bring us back to a more physical understanding. It has to do with the fact that um, stress, which is a, a tensor, it's a second ring tensor, has a number of has six independent components. And what was done experimentally was to look at the change, the effective change in the resistivity that was measured uh, based on coordinating different component, non-zero components of that. And so the response was then linked into this fourth rank uh, piezo resistance tensor. And the problem here is that uh, they used stress as the metric rather than strain. Because when you think of the deformation that exists within these crystals, it is the atomic positions that really help define the change into the energy bands. But nonetheless, this was the framework really up and still does exist uh, in which these things are described. But one of the first uh, practical applications, too, of, of this, uh, it was recognized pretty early, uh, that this could be used to uh, look at uh, changes uh, within, uh, within structures uh, and uh, very nicely, in this case, uh, by using materials uh, that are semiconducting based. Uh, there are more efficient ways of doing it now, but it was recognized uh, for 50 years then of the power of piezo resistivity on these structures. Okay, so if we give a couple of brief examples about how this has been incorporated, uh, when we look at N-type uh, field effect transistors, uh, the mobility enhancement that first was really, uh, the first um, platform on which this was used was to uh, place silicon, and we call it strain silicon in this case, because it's grown heteroepitaxially on a uh, buffer layer uh, of silicon germanium. And so this could have a certain fraction of germanium uh, within your silicon. And the reason for doing this is that germanium has a larger equilibrium lattice parameter than that of silicon. And so you can extend uh, the, the template on which this silicon can be grown. In this case, uh, clearly you can see that this is a biaxial case, which just means that both in-plane directions show this larger lattice parameter. And so therefore you get this in-plane biaxial strain within the silicon channel. But what does that do? So if you look at some of the, uh, some of the curves then, in terms of the electron mobility, the effective electron mobility, that you can get an enhancement. Uh, in this case, it was demonstrated close to 75%. Uh, and it is uh, theorized that this can easily go up to 2x or so in terms of NFET mobility. So that's quite a large knob to make. Uh, and it is uh, right now the fact that when you see changes in device performance by a few percent, that that's enough to, to really drive the industry towards a certain, uh, towards a certain direction, that this is uh, a remarkable amount of improvement that one can get. Now, the other, so the complementary uh, material or the complementary structure is that it's based on a P-type uh, field effect transistor. Uh, and the structure that has really shown uh, the, the most benefit uh, 
in that has been the incorporation of uh, uh, structures, stressor structures that are embedded within the silicon. So basically, the silicon is recessed, is there, etched out of certain region. It's cleaned, and then a material is deposited uh, in the source and drain regions. In this case, again, the silicon germanium is used. And that induces a change in the lattice uh, constant here in the channel region. Uh, it's been described as uniaxial, and I cringe whenever I see that description because, again, my background is in mechanics. And uh, it is clear that it, it, it's meant to emphasize the fact that the, the direction in which you see the change is in the channel direction. And it is basically uh, essentially in that direction. Uh, but because of Poisson effects, you clearly will get triaxial strain within these systems. And so uh, you, you, could, you could argue that this refers to the stress state uh, being uniaxial in nature. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, again, this, this term has, has stuck. Now, the, uh, the key aspect is that even though in this implementation uh, by Scott Thompson uh, in 2004 um, showed very clearly that you do get an increase in mobility, uh, in this case it was enhanced maybe about 50% or so, but really the benefit of using uh, this technique with P-type transistors is that the intrinsic mobility of, of the, the P-FET uh, is much lower than that for M-FET. And so this represented a huge knob. Uh, in terms of boosting performance. So the values here are roughly about 4 to 5x that one could expect a mobility enhancement if the, the engineering and the strain was done in a correct way. OK, so I showed the first examples of how this was implemented. And, and since then, the industry has, has, uh, has developed uh, uh, some ways. But I think we could break it down into um, some uh, straightforward uh, ways of describing what, what, uh, what ways have been developed. And one of them is in the incorporation of stress liner materials. And that simply refers to a material that is deposited over the, the structure that has a residual stress within it. And this residual stress can uh, clearly uh, induce a change. It's really, again, due to the edge effects. Due to the fact that at this region where we have the spacer that uh, insulates the gate region from source and drain regions, that this change in geometry uh, represents uh, a stress concentration. And so you can think of that as a way of uh, a concentrating uh, a force at, this, uh, at, at the, the top of the, of the uh, silicon substrate here, right near the edges of the channel. And the key aspect here is that you can see that if you have a compressive film here, that will induce in-plane tension underneath, but it will induce compression uh, in the region of the channel. And so uh, you have the same side of strain within your film as you do in your channel, and so you can easily engineer a material that would be compressive or tensile uh, to accomplish that. And the second way is the way that I showed uh, also in the PFED example, in which you can use this uh, embedded stressor structure in which you have in-plane loading of the channel as opposed to something that comes from an overlying structure. And so you can use uh, silicon germanium for the case of wanting to incorporate in-plane compressive strain here within the channel region. You can uh, use a, uh, a substitutional atom such as carbon, which has a smaller lattice parameter, to induce uh, in-plane tensile strain. And because again, if you think of these as elastic parameters, then the, there's a symmetry uh, to how these, uh, how these uh, generate the mechanics within the future. And the other aspect that's been developed over, really over the past three or four years or so, is the fact that you can enhance this uh, change in the mechanics of the structure by making it more compliant. And that actually makes the, it indicates a more efficient way of transferring strain, and that's done by removing the gate region that's here that again used to be polysilicon based, but now has incorporated different types of materials, uh, both in the dielectric insulation, but also in the gate itself. And so we've seen the change from polysilicon to one that involves metallic materials. But the key point here is that it's the load sharing that exists within both of these structures um, that help facilitate the change and the transfer of strain into where we want it. So any way that we can make the system more flexible you can induce more strain. And that may or may not be a good thing, as I'll explain later. So 
there are metrics that exist that have been developed to help understand and quantify uh, this change uh, in the behavior based on uh, the stress field within the system. And we've learned heuristically about which, which types of strain are beneficial for that process. And what I'm showing here just are the three independent components of that piezo resistivity for Frank tensor before for your N-type silicon as well as your P-type silicon. But what we've learned is the fact that uh, to enhance uh, NFET mobility, it's generally advantageous to use uh, tensile strain. Uh, that refers to uh, along the longitudinal direction, uh, the direction which current flows, as well as that in-plane, a transverse to current flow. And you can actually also, uh, for good measure, incorporate compressive out-of-plane strain, and that does benefit NFET mobility. In converse, PFET uh, types of mobility are uh, enhanced by using compressive strain along the channel direction, but tensile strain transverse and tensile strain uh, in the out-of-plane direction. And so clearly, all states of strain are at play here and can be at play and do impact performance that we see. Uh, there are other aspects that you may have come across that show that the orientation uh, can have a big impact. Um, the fact that for NFETs, um, the O01 silicon surface is one that's, that's um, used very often. It's in fact uh, fairly isotropic with respect to the in-plane direction in which the channel exists. The problem is that's not the case for PFET. And so that really helped to define the fact that PFETs um, show much better enhancement and mobility when they are put along the 110 in-plane direction. And so that really, unfortunately, that, that drives the direction in which these things are processed. Nevertheless, there are schemes that look at not only different orientations, but what's called here a hybrid orientation, where on the same substrate, you can actually try to grow different orientations. So this refers to the out-of-plane direction, basically. How in one case, you'll have uh, an 001, so along a line with the cube, and then one that you have 45 degrees to that point. Does the, um, the number there depend on concentration? Exactly. Oh, yes, you you you, <laughs> you you help me out there. Uh, so the fact that uh, not only that there are many parameters that go into this, and these numbers came from Smith's first paper, and the fact that we do know in reality there's a wide variation that can occur, and it has to do with the fact that yes, that there's a complicated band structure that's at play here, not just a signal, uh, a sig uh, single uh, uh, force or uh, orientation of forces. So we know that the band structure, the carrier density all impact these, uh, but also the doping. And unfortunately, this is a nonlinear effect that we see uh, in the piezo resistivity. And in fact, what I'm showing here in this uh, column corresponds to the data that was generated a few years later that showed that within the inversion layer that we really cared about, um, we can see some, uh, some uh, wide variety particularly in the longitudinal direction and the transverse direction um, on the values. And so the question is, what number do you really use here uh, for, these, for, these, uh, for these types of quantities? And, and the, the, what I would argue the net result is that we have to come up with another way rather than pure electrical measurements to be able to quantify the stress that exists within these systems to have any hope of understanding what would, what would be happening and to be able to predict that in future devices. So um, most people might be familiar with the fact that uh, the mechanical response within films um, can be easily seen uh, and was observed, uh, um, again, about the same time frame, over 100 years ago. The fact that if you have, um, say, a, a wafer uh, and you deposit a certain film with a residual stress on it, uh, the way to equilibrate that stress uh, involves blowing that wafer that you have. And in some cases, this can be alarmingly high in terms of the, the curvature that exists within, within the wafers. Uh, nevertheless, that can be used to help quantify the stress that exists here. Um, what I start with showing here is delta epsilon, and that refers to a quantity called the eigenstrain. Uh, and that will help delineate the fact that there is a difference between the equilibrium state of that film and the substrate on which it resides that helps drive this, this change uh, that leads to this elastic relaxation. And you can see right here, uh, for assuming a biaxial st uh, stress state, isotropic biaxial stress state, 
uh, in the film that you can relate that, that stress um, to, the, uh, to the elastic constants uh, of the film, both the Young's modulus as well as the Poisson ratio. And in fact, you can then, uh, by more, uh, other methods, uh, look at how you can generate from a force and moment balance what the stress is within the film. And it's related very nicely in the simplest approximation where your substrate is much thicker uh, than your film, something that only takes the, the film thickness uh, as the only uh, quantity, uh, assuming that you know the substrate modulus and the substrate thickness, what that, that film stress will be. And uh, you can actually do uh, a more uh, complete analysis by incorporating a finite uh, film thickness to show that, yes, you can do this relationship between the film stress and these quantities. So that's fine. You can quantify this, this effect. But of course, there are several assumptions that go into it. Um, the fact that clearly for this to occur, we assume that there's uniform stress throughout this film, so that the elastic properties, thickness, and that you have perfect adhesion at all points on here. Those all have to be in play. Uh, well, in structures, clearly we don't have blanket films anymore. And the mere fact of, by incorporating uh, edge effects, by, by basically, uh, any time you, uh, you remove these materials, uh, you're changing the strain state of the system. And so you do see elastic relaxation, which is what you need to drive these, uh, this, this behavior. But it is uh, something that is definitely spatially uh, localized. And you have to understand what the length scale of those strain distributions are. Uh, it's not necessarily something that uh, is, comes from one dimension, but can come from different parameters. So I've gave them, given the introduction to why we, we care about understanding strain. And so the next step would be to see what, it, what techniques and what, what modeling uh, approaches have been used to try to understand what that would be. And uh, those exist both in analytical and numerical form. So let's go straight to them. What I'm showing here is, is the fact that uh, the normal stress in this direction along x, uh, say we have a film with an eigenstrain in it. And far away from this, assuming we can get far enough away from this, inner, this edge in the film, that we have a certain uh, far field stress that exists within the structure, and that that uh, sits on a substrate. And the fact that as we start to approach that edge, the amount of normal stress that is seen at this free edge has to be zero. Um, this is just from uh, Newton's second law, or Newton's third law, sorry. Uh, and the fact that so at some distance from that edge, you start to see the development of that stress. Now, uh, there are several techniques, and the metrics that I'm using here are simply to describe which techniques are appropriate to look at this particular geometry when we have an overlying film with a free edge that sits on that substrate. And the, there are a number that I'll, that I'll describe uh, later. Uh, there are some here that aren't appropriate for the structure, but are nevertheless important for some of these models that are developed. Uh, and uh, clearly for both uh, the finite element method, which many of you are probably familiar with, but there are other numerical approaches such as that based on the boundary element method can clearly uh, incorporate the mechanics of these types of structures. So I've delineated uh, the, the various models that have been seen and have been used in literature and to two different, uh, 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 two different uh, camps. Uh, one that, that I'm basically describing here, the fact that we assume that there's a plane strain condition in the plane uh, normal to the, the screen here. That simply means that you don't have deformation uh, outside of that plane, and so that simplifies the analysis. So really this could be nd, where d is the dimension, this could be n plus 1d. But let's, let's keep it simple to something that's 1d and 2d. And uh, I'll go through uh, four different techniques that we use. Um, one that's based on the concept of composite mechanics, uh, and one that's, that's based very similarly on that. And then in the two-dimensional regime, I'll talk about techniques that are based both on uh, this concept of edge force, which I showed in the example earlier, and then one that incorporates uh, the ideas that uh, were started uh, really back in the 30s, uh, that then developed into things uh, that incorporate inclusions. And so Eshelby is a very famous name uh, that's used those, types of, those sorts of ideas. Uh, I won't go into the analysis that, that looks at uh, basically uh, a representation 
of the mechanics of these systems as either series of polynomials or trigonometric functions. And basically for those, you have exponential functions that have a certain decay rate, and you generally take the weakest of the singularities to help describe what's going on in both of these cases. So those, those uh, techniques do exist, and they have been in, implemented. Uh, but really one of the main limiters here that I want to touch on is the fact that uh, when we consider these types of models, um, one of the fundamental limitations is that uh, there is no out-of-plane dependence of the stress. And so you're basically limiting yourself, yourself to, to thinking that the, uh, distribu the description of the stress uh, does not change with, with depth or with height. And so really you have a uniform stress with respect to that dimension. So you have something that has to start at a value and then change only in this x direction on either side. Uh, and I'll show why that is a limiting assumption. For these two-dimensional models, uh, generally you see for closed form solutions two that exist in terms of the geometry that's looked at. One in which you have an infinite uh, space, um, such as that uh, of a buried interface within the substrate, or what's more uh, relevant to these types of structures, something that has a very thick substrate with respect to the, uh, the dimensions of the structure that you're analyzing. And so semi-infinite um, models do exist to help describe that. And there actually is a hybrid uh, uh, technique that I'll, that I'll touch on as well that incorporates uh, both, of these, uh, both of these approaches into one uh, called the distributed force. And I'll show how um, that borrows information from both of these to give uh, also an example of mechanical response. So the first one I'll touch on is called the shear lag model. And again, this had its, uh, its uh, as you can tell from the dates, this was really something that was developed around the time of the Second World War. And it was uh, an attempt to understand how when you uh, bonded uh, joints together, such as that for airplanes, uh, what sort of uh, adhesion was required to keep them from falling apart. Um, so a fairly pressing uh, question that had to be answered. Uh, uh, in terms of its application to looking at semiconductor uh, structures, uh, Chen and Nelson uh, wrote a paper in 1979 that showed how this could be implemented. It had to do with the idea that there is an interfacial or glue layer that might exist uh, between uh, two structures. And in this case, we can think of our film that has a residual stress and the substrate that exists underneath it. And that the strain is basically transferred across that, that, that boundary. And so this means that there have to be some mechanical properties that exist within the interfacial layer that clearly dictate how that is transferred. And so what I'm showing here is the fact that there is a finite thickness to this interfacial layer, and there is a shear modulus that defines the, the, shear, the transfer shear strain here. And so uh, pictorially, what you'll expect to see is that the shear strain is, is zero at the center of these structures. And then as you approach to either edge, plus or minus L in the x direction, you maximize the shear strain that's there, or the shear stress in that case. And the fact that the shear stress is assumed that it's proportional to the slip between the displacement in the film and that of the substrate. And this proportionality constant here uh, is really the ratio then of the shear, uh, the, the shear modulus to that of the thickness. Now that there are other assumptions that go into this type of approach. One is that we're dealing with linear elastic isotropic materials. Um, the first uh, uh, implementation of this only looked at the effects of uh, normal stress in the plane here. Uh, and so this actually is very simply solved by second order ordinary differential equation. So very simple to implement. Uh, you can actually extend that a bit to, to consider the fact that since we know that these substrates do warp due to the presence of these overlying blanket films and film features, that we can think about the, uh, the, the bending and the deformation that exists in the vertical uh, component. And then so you can create an analogous uh, formula here that incorporates the bending stress that develops, the peel stress, uh, and how that leads to the difference in the vertical deformation that you get. By doing, I won't go through the math here, but by doing so, you basically change it to a sixth order ODE. But the importance is it's still an ordinary differential equation, so one can solve it. Um, the other limiting uh, assumption is that uh, you, should, uh, you should return to the Timoshenko limit, uh, which I showed earlier, when your film, uh, when your feature size approaches that of infinity. So that bounds the problem to some extent. 
Uh, one of the assumptions that I showed before in these types of approaches is that your feature size and your substrate dimension are the same. And that's really a, a, key, a, a key limiting assumption that is unphysical in some of these models. Um, and I'll show why that impacts it. But also that we again assume that there is a perfect adhesion here between the film uh, and this interfacial layer and that of the underlying substrate. And that's actually about, that's a reasonable assumption for many of these structures. You can clearly expect to see different heterogeneous states of, of deformation here, uh, but it's not, uh, not necessary to look at the, uh, the mechanical response in these systems. Now, the, uh, basically an analog to this type of technique was developed uh, by Abraham Sugir, uh, and uh, you actually still see it implemented uh, in much literature. I came across a paper um, this year, in fact, that incorporated it. And it's the same concept, that there is a shear stress here between the film and the substrate, uh, and that will uh, basically dictate the strain that's transferred between the two. Uh, the problem now is that you've, re you've removed that interfacial layer. And so you have another proportionality constant that's dependent on the elastic constants of the material as well as the thickness of those materials. And the shear transfer is dictated by them. But if you assume that there's perfect bonding between the film and the substrate, uh, you basically create a contradiction. And so there's no way that you can really get slip in these systems uh, and therefore generate a finite shear stress and still have a perfectly bonded interface. Nevertheless, this model still persists in the analysis of these, of these structures. Um, there are still a couple of other limits that go with uh, the behavior, uh, but what we'll show later is that um, this uh, proves to be unsatisfactory, let's say, in describing the mechanics. Now, I mentioned the edge force model as well, and that one probably is one of the, one of the earliest, and it's based on uh, work that you know, Michelle uh, published, but it's the idea that Guzanesque followed uh, back in the 19th century, where let's just say that you have a force that acts on the surface of your feature, uh, and in the case of Michelle's work, he assumed this plane strain condition again for the plane of the, uh, the, the board here. Uh, you again take the assumption of linear elastically isotropic materials, but the fact that by considering, by lumping all of the effect of the film within a single isolated edge force right here at the corner, uh, you remove um, the constraint that film might place uh, on the rest of the substrate material. And so clearly there are um, some trade-offs in making that, that assumption. Uh, but the force that's here, the edge force, it's a force per unit width, and it's related to the, um, the blanket film stress within here multiplied by the thickness of your material. Um, there are various ways in which this has been implemented. One that was implemented in the 60s was to consider not just one edge, but two edges, similar to the, uh, to the device, the strain silicon device that I showed earlier. Um, the other aspect is to not stick with only a plane strain condition, but you can actually uh, take the idea of taking these forces and placing them in arbitrary positions within the structure, such as one that has rectangular or other types of features, even circular features, that exist on, on some of the substrate. So the transition to three dimensions is, uh, is quite applicable in this, this technique. The problem, of course, is that we have no real prediction of what's going on in the film in this, in this approach. Uh, it's something that only considers the effect of the film within the substrate region, uh, but perhaps that's OK. It, again, depends on the application that you're looking at. Uh, one of the uh, unfortunate things that exists for many elasticity solutions is that the substrate stress is going to be singular at these corners and at these edges. Uh, and you, you can see it clearly here. So this is an example of the representation of the normal stress, the in-plane stress, uh, in this direction. And you can see it, it uh, very nicely has a form that only involves uh, the, the directions here. Uh, which, if you're at the surface when z drops to zero, you have a one over r dependence of that, of that stress. But clearly, this will be singular. Um, the problem is that, again, there's no interface that exists in this approach between the film and the substrate. And so, therefore, any um, real response of that film feature, um, thereby including the shear stress that exists at this interface, as well as the peel stress, is non existent. 
Now, there are other ways in which you can incorporate this, which um, leads to more realistic conditions. Uh, one that I was able to implement uh, assumed that, okay, let's consider the fact that uh, there is uh, some symmetry to the crystal in which we're analyzing. So the nice thing about silicon is that it's cubic, it's, it's diamond cubic, actually. And so there are a number of uh, symmetry orientations. So this is, for those who are familiar, is a stereographic proje projection of some of those symmetries. So if we consider our O01 silicon wafer, uh, there's a four-fold in-plane symmetry that was shown uh, earlier today. Uh, those exist on the other cube axes. But you have a variety of other axes, such as these two-fold axes here and the 110 directions uh, that are also relevant for this type of analysis. Um, for completeness, I show the 111 threefold axes, which really define the cubic symmetry uh, within uh, these systems. And the idea here is actually we can exploit these symmetries to come up with a more simple uh, a re rendering rather than a full three-dimensional uh, response when we're considering the fact that there is elastic anisotropy within our silicon crystal. And so uh, what happens is the form that I showed the equation earlier takes a bit of a more complex uh, form, uh, but not, not intractable by any way, because now we have terms, again, that depend on the uh, directions and dimensions, but also incorporate uh, a couple of constants, and those constants relate to the elastic constants and the orientations within our silicon. So if we look at one of the common orientations that's been implemented for silicon devices, we have our 001 wafer in the 110 direction, and these are the constants that correspond to that condition. Uh, you can see that if you limit yourself to the isotropic case, you're actually reduced back to the, the, the form of these constants that do give us the same expression as earlier. And you can generate similar expressions for the outer plane stress within the, within the substrate, as well as the shear stress within the substrate. And they just have a different uh, numerator here. Uh, but again, the problem is that you're still dealing with the same disadvantages that you saw in terms of the geometry and the fact that the, the, the film feature is basically absent from this analysis. Okay, so one that was uh, developed as a hybrid between these two techniques actually came uh, about 40 years ago uh, in Erdogan's uh, group. And one in which that incorporated the fact that, uh, yes, this really, there really is something that's sitting above the substrate, and uh, its, uh, its, its normal stress will decay as a function of position. So where you are in terms of this film feature and underneath the substrate does make a difference. But the idea is that the constraint, the change in elastic relaxation that you see within the film has to be accommodated in some way by the substrate. And so the idea was to take an iterative approach then to solve this, in which you now consider the fact that uh, underneath the substrate that any, uh, any uh, increase in the film position has to be incorporated by an increase in the displacement uh, in the underlying substrate. And that reaches some maximum here that's defined by a constant that depends very simply on the elastic constants of the material, as well as that driving force of stress, the blanket film stress. And that uh, if you look outside of the film feature, you have a form that was similar to the edge force that was shown before. And the way in which you calculate these structures is basically to have a compatibility equation that exists on that interface. So we get to some perfect bonding. And the fact that the normal strain has to be the same on either side here leads to this expression. There's basically a convolution, you can recognize some of the terms here, of that edge force solution along with the, uh, the direction and the distance that you are from, uh, from a certain, uh, from a, a particular point. And the way that this was uh, implemented by Ku uh, in the 70s was to basically numerically discretize your system and create a system of number of points here. Um, there are examples, that, so this could be solved for the case of an infinite feature so that you're looking at a step edge, or one that incorporates finite feature sizes, which is appropriate to the structure that are analyzed. Um, some of the problems, again, is the fact that the, um, there is no out-of-plane elastic relaxation. And that really is the key aspect here. Um, but the other problem is that we do see uh, singular uh, representations of separate stress. And so we have a variety of analytical models that have gone through now. How do we know which one, if any of these, are appropriate to look at the structures? And to do that, I want to uh, 
reiterate uh, one of the points from Professor Lundstrom today in the fact that it's, as you said, it was nice when uh, you have a way to uh, develop the experiment along with the model. Uh, my argument is that it's really a critical aspect. You need to have that, a strong coupling uh, between any model that you develop and the, the experimental results that, that you can't go independently. And so to do this, I'll show a, a brief example that we developed, uh, or we measured uh, through the use of X-ray microdiffraction. And the idea here is simple, that if we have, say, a finite film feature, the silicon germanium example that I showed earlier, in this case, we have 16% germanium. And so that roughly corresponds to a difference in lattice parameter of 0.6% between the silicon feature, which therefore would be in compression, uh, sitting heterotaxically on our silicon substrate. And what we want to do is monitor the change in the response of that silicon germanium as we start from the edge and work our way uh, to either side. Um, the features that we used in this case were lithographically patterned, starting with a blanket film and then etched into structures that were 100 microns. So basically a plane strain condition in this y direction, and then one that had a variety of feature widths uh, in this x direction so we could help probe uh, the different cases that are there. And so what we'd expect to see, again, is the normal stress that you have here starts at a map. If this is wide enough, we have a value that corresponds to the blanket film stress, and then one that decays as we approach the edges uh, either side to zero. Okay, so the way in which we measure this is uh, through the use of synchrotron microbeam measurements. And so I'll just give a, a brief picture of what goes on and how, how we do that with the setup. Uh, but essentially, this is work that was done at the Argonne National Laboratory uh, at uh, the 2 ig beam line. And what's used is this represents x-rays that basically come through a focusing optic. And it's the fact that you can actually use matter and the change in density of that matter to help focus and refract uh, the in incoming uh, photons. And it's used something called the zone plate, which basically consists of a series of concentric rings and it is that change, again, from uh, a certain mass to having air or vacuum uh, that causes the refraction effect. Um, we have a beam stop that blocks the direct beam, then, and a way to block out the other harmonics that come from this. But basically, we look at the first order diffraction. We we're able to focus that, in this case, using the energy that we chose at a value that's roughly about a quarter of a micron or so. Full width half max. And so that's, that's more than enough resolution to do the measurements of what I showed earlier. And one of the nice aspects of choosing an energy such as this value is that it's high enough that we're actually able to use the fluorescence uh, from the germanium within our silicon germanium to have a precise measurement of where we are on the measurement as well as the diffraction information that we're getting. And what we're going to do in this setup is simply look at the change in the out-of-plane lattice spacing, again, as we raster the sample underneath this beam. So the uh, diffractive intensity is collected by this detector here. We have a fluorescence detector that tells us, again, where we're sitting when we're at the edge and we're off the silica germanium feature when we're inside of it. And we're basically looking the at the change in the lattice spacing, this out-of-plane direction as, as a function of position. And what we use, of course, is Bragg's Law in this case, uh, because we have a material that's thin enough that it, the Bragg's Law is applicable to this analysis. And I'll show cases where that may no longer be, uh, be satisfied. But basically what we're doing is we're measuring this detector angle, the difference between the incident beam and uh, twice that. Uh, and then that corresponds to what's called the Bragg angle. And that Bragg angle is directly related to the lattice spacing of interest. Uh, as well as the wavelength of the radiation that we're using, which is fairly well known. Okay, so what I'm showing here is the results that we get. So on the top is the uh, map of the fluorescence that we get, uh, showing us clearly when we're at the edges and, and when we're within the feature itself. And what I'm showing down here is the change that we, in the measured drag angle as a function of distance here. Uh, and you can see very clearly the upturn uh, in that Bragg angle as we approach the edges, indicating that we have a reduction in the Poisson expansion um, that's caused by the, the in-plane compression of the silicon germanium that's sitting on the silicon lattice. And so uh, we have smaller out-of-plane lattice spacing here at these regions, and we 
we basically reach uh, an equilibrium, not an equilibrium, but uh, the biaxial stress pit state within the center of our picture. And so all we have to do then is use the elastic constants to then determine how this change in elastic relaxation uh, tells us what our stress will be as a function of position uh, along the feature width. And what I'm plotting here uh, is that change in normal in-plane stress um, divided or normalized by the, by the film stress uh, as a function of position. And you can see with this cartoon here I showed what was happening earlier that we have a fully strained condition in the center of the region and then that decays uh, to, to uh, a value that almost corresponds to uniaxial stress here. The only stress that you would get, you would not get any stress out of plane because the thickness of the film is pretty small compared to the dimension of the system. As well, you don't have any uh, transverse or stress in the x direction here. So the only stress that would exist would be along the, 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 out of, uh, the, uh, the direction normal of the, the screen here. And what you can see pretty nicely is that uh, it's a very good indicator about when we lose the ability uh, to maintain maximum strain at the center of our devices. And this is basically, one can think of this as an aspect ratio rather than a, a physical uh, length scale that's described. And so you can see that for the um, features that are less than 10 microns or so in width, uh, we, start to, we start to sense that impact. Uh, but the fact that elastic relaxation extends quite extensively within, uh, from this feature edge. So most people think of St. Bernard effects, or St. Bernard's principle, when they look at these edge effects in relaxation, and think that maybe if uh, a rule of thumb would be three to five times the dimension, the length scale of the system, you'd start to see the, the, the full strain. And that's not true. In fact, for these systems, you can see things that are easily 20 times of that film thickness. So, what this means is that whenever we're analyzing the mechanics of these systems, we have to look very far field uh, in terms of understanding their impact on uh, the performance. And then you can see for the case of a one micron feature, so this is a, an aspect ratio of one to five, that there's a tremendous amount of relaxation that's caused uh, to the point where there's only 15% of the starting strain within our structure. So how did, go ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you change the film thickness, then the, you know, the edge effect um, becomes... Becomes even worse. So if, if you increase film thickness, that's right, so it becomes more pronounced. And so it's this concept of an aspect ratio that really can be used to drive these things. And so the advantage of going to thinner films is that you help pre preserve the, uh, the, uh, the, the biaxial strain state that might exist in the systems. The problem there is that there's a, there's a, this is a load sharing effect. And so the volume of stressor material has dropped by the fact that you thinned it. And so the amount of response that you're driving into the region of interest is lower. And that's a key aspect that you have to engineer. Okay, so by looking that, so let's look only at this, the center, uh, center value in terms of the stress here uh, for these features. And what I'm plotting here, then, uh, are the values that we get from X-ray diffraction. And what I'm showing here is the predictions that we would expect, uh, given the three models that I showed earlier. Uh, so the values for these, the, the constants, come from the elastic uh, <coughs> constants of the, the various materials. And you can see that there's a wide variety of, uh, of uh, predictive behavior. Uh, one of the most notably is the fact that, again, this, this lap shear uh, approach by Sugir greatly underestimates um, the, the amount of film stress. So it predicts basically uh, no, uh, very little uh, stress that you'd expect to see, something that's not represented what's going on here. And the fact that the shear lag model that I showed earlier is one that at least um, heuristically does seem to show a, a good correspondence to the data. Um, the form of the, the stress at this normal stress at that uh, center position is something that basically looks like uh, an inverse of a hyperbolic cosine. So if we look at the case here where we have a congruence between two of the, the formula, at least, we can uh, look at the, the simulated stress distributions as a function of position across the features. But what's interesting here that I want to uh, indicate is that 
for both these models, we do see a similar uh, uptick, at least, in the form. And what's, what's wrong with the, shear, with the lap shear model is that it's not describing the elastic behavior well. But with the distributed force, we have a different, it's a different paradigm completely. And so it's predicting a, a different form of relaxation with respect to these normalized feature widths. So now what I'm showing is a plot where we are able to take the micro V measurements across the feature size and compare them to the models. And the fact that in the central region, the, the prediction is pretty good. But you can clearly see that the data fall between these two. And so the two models represent bounds on what we might expect to see. Um, we know that um, the, if we look at the limiting behavior here, the asymptotic behavior as we approach the free edges are completely different. One is the square root, and one goes as the uh, as, uh, as linear, basically to that the stress concentration to those points. Uh, but the fact that since we see this uh, discrepancy between the, the data and these two models leads us to ask why, what's going on? And it's the fact again that uh, these are fundamental problems with these models. Um, one that the associated with the shear lag, as I mentioned before, we have the assumption that our substrate has the same width as our film. That's clearly not the case. Um, there always will be some elastic interaction that exists uh, between the coupling of the substrate underneath the film and that that exists outside of the film region. And with the case of the distributive force, we have the opposite problem. Uh, we have the fact that um, because of the, uh, the equation that dictates the compatibility between these two, we expect to see that any time you have a reduction in the stress in the film, that there has to be a corresponding increase in the stress within the substrate. So let's consider a limiting case in our film. Then. Let's consider almost a fin type structure, right? That is almost infinite in, in height, but very thin in width. Now, in that case, uh, in this model, we would expect to see practically no in plane stress because we have something that's almost completely elastic or relaxed. This model would say then that we have a tremendous, all of the stress is transferred back into our substrate. And clearly that also is not the case. And it's the fact that we, the distributed force does not allow the fact that in reality, the film, the, the very narrow film feature will have basically no uh, normal stress except in the very region close to this interface. So we have to have a way to incorporate the Z dependence into any of these models to get a true understanding of the mechanics. And so one way we could do that is to look at some other models. And one that I indicated earlier was the Escher V inclusion model. And so this had its origins uh, back in the 30s when uh, it was called nucleotide strain. The concept is you have a certain force and you want to see that mechanical response within the system. And so this can either be for an infinite structure uh, and a matrix, basically. Or you could have a half space that was developed by Ray Mindlin from Columbia uh, in the 30s to help describe what's going on. And so this can be either a center of dilatation where we have an inclusion here which has some different property from that of the matrix. Uh, it either can be due to uh, a difference in the lattice mismatch, which would be an eigenstrain. It can be due to different elastic constants of that material versus the matrix. Uh, and what actually we first considered was um, you can have this embedded region which had both those quantities. And so how he described it is that uh, through the use of a fourth order uh, Eshelby tensor, you can actually say that whatever the, um, the response of that system is can be lumped very nicely into um, this equivalent eigenstrain. And so we don't know the values of this tensor uh, offhand, but we do know that given a certain driving force, in this case, let's assume that we're straining the matrix with the, with the inclusion inside, that we have uh, a response that either is dictated by the fact that it is a heterogeneous structure, so that the, in this case, I'm referring to the stiffness tensor, which contains the elastic constants, uh, is different. Or we have, as I indicated earlier, the fact that there is a residual strain state within here that's deforming what's around it. Uh, and it's the fact, again, that we need a compatibility condition at this interface that links, in this case, the stresses in both. Those. So the stress, uh, basically, on the inside of this interface has to be the same as that on the outside. Otherwise, there's the bonding, and, and this model is no longer valid. But you can see that there are a host of uh, uh, different tensorial quantities that are here. 
But the key aspect is, again, assuming a, a spherical inclusion, uh, that you can have very nice uh, closed form solutions uh, for the, you know, the representation of the actual strain, and that is generated by this equivalent eigenstrain. Now, we're not limited to spherical inclusions, and that, again, is the butt of a joke of assuming a spherical cow. Uh, and, uh, and trying to optimize the problem of, of generating milk from it. Uh, we have the ability to look at different types of, uh, and more relevant uh, types of uh, inclusions. And the one, the one that I'm showing here, again, is a plain strain condition of uh, an actually the inclusion. And this was developed by John Davis about a decade ago, in which we're looking at a rectangular feature. Uh, so this is something that's much more representative of what we have in our, in our systems. So let's assume that this embedded region uh, is perfectly bonded with what exists underneath. Um, there is a half space substrate um, that has a free surface here. And it's that free surface that actually changes the deformation as to one that we would expect of this sitting within a central region. And that's shown here uh, in the equation where the displacement that we get is actually a, a linear superposition of what we'd expect in the infinite matrix, and then one that's uh, complemented by what's called a twin gradient. So this is a more complicated form, but it's the same idea that this is, comes from potential theory, that there is a certain uh, displacement potential that's here that can be calculated and incorporates the effect of the, the, the free, uh, the, this freestanding surface that's there. The nice thing about these types of approaches is again, because they are linear elastic, you can superimpose the strain fields that get created from the different uh, techniques. And so that's really a key aspect in looking at different types of stressor structures and their impact. Uh, it can be implemented fairly simply. Um, the assumptions that are that, one of the assumptions in this particular approach is that the, um, the isotropic elastic constants are the same for the inclusion in the substrate. But for many of the cases that I've shown before, such as silicon germanium and silicon carbon, that's, not, that's, that's, that's a reasonable assumption. The one that I'm showing here, of course, is that we're sticking with a plane strain condition uh, that's by no means uh, uh, limiting to this technique, but for this implementation, we'll, we'll make that assumption. And that's the twin gradient I indicated earlier. So what I'm showing now is a, re a representation of what we see um, from such a technique. And what I'm assuming here is that we have embedded stressor regions on either side of a region that basically is analogous to our silicon channel. And these are fairly wide stressor features with respect to the dimensions that we typically would see. So these, in this case, there's a certain thickness and the width of these stressor uh, stru structures are about 10 times that. But what you can see very nicely is that we get significant strain that's induced in between them. And it's this in-plane loading that can drive significant deformation within our feature. You can also see that close to this free surface up here, we have a tremendous increase uh, in that strain. And the reason why this is important is that in our devices, uh, most times this region is the most important in terms of looking at the current carrying uh, areas of our device. So imagine your source and drain here, and your channel sits right there. Uh, what you can also see is that the magnitude of the strain that's generated here can be larger than the driving force of the strain that exists within these two regions. And that's simply, again, a factor of the geometry that's here. It depends on the aspect ratio of these features and how deep they are, how close they are to that top surface. Uh, but what we've learned from this is that not only is it dependent on those uh, geometric uh, factors, but it's a more efficient method of incorporating strain within these, uh, within these types of uh, systems. So now two of the numerical approaches that I mentioned earlier, we should also compare them. Uh, one that uh, many of you are familiar with is the fondant element method. And I just want to briefly go through uh, some of the assumptions that go into how one incorporates a fondant element method. Uh, it's based on essentially a weak formulation of the governing differential equation. Those are based on elasticity. But it's the fact that you uh, discretize your entire volume, that of your film feature, that of your substrate. And so if we uh, blow up the region of where, say, we want to uh, evaluate the deformation within the feature, we have a series of nodes. And let's just assume a 2D representation here. So we solve, the, we basically interpolate the solution in this region of interest based on the solutions that we do at these nodal values. 
So it's only these nodal values that contribute to the impact that we see uh, in this position here. Uh, but this is an uh, clearly it's an approximate solution of what's going on within the domain, but that in many cases is a necessary step to get a tractable solution for finite features. Uh, and one that's very well implemented, there are a variety of packages that incorporate these effects. Um, one of the key uh, adders is the fact that the solution to this can, act, can be very well optimized and has been very well optimized over the past two decades or so. And it's the fact, one of the factors is that when you look at the solution, the matrix equation that is used to solve for the unknowns, it's the fact that you only have certain uh, nodes that interact with each of these individual nodes. And so what that means is your, your matrix might only have a few bands in which you can solve. And so it's a much more efficient way to then get, uh, in, to invert this matrix and then come up with the answers. Now I'm going to introduce a different way in which we can analyze uh, this using numerical methods. And many of you probably haven't heard of this, but it's a boundary element method. Uh, it was developed uh, also probably about the time frame that uh, elasticity was was uh, being uh, going through its renaissance in the uh, 1900s or so. But it took uh, about 50 years before computing power was available to do the analysis. It's an integral solution versus something that's, that's uh, the weak formulation. Uh, one of the primary advantages is that you only have to discretize the surface. And so that saves you a tremendous number of, of variables in which you're having to solve for the number of elements that you're looking at. And it's the fact that it is an exact solution now for that same point that we're interested in. But the fact that that point is, is affected by every surface element here rather than the case of the finite element where you're only looking at the nodal values within that element in which the point resides. Um, the good thing is that there are ways in which you can integrate the influence coefficients, um, but the problem is that we've lost our banded matrix. So these matrices, even though they're smaller in size, are fully populated. And so it's uh, not necessarily an efficient way to solve that structure. And one of the main limiters is the fact that when we're looking at the stress state within these features, as we get close to that interface, unfortunately, the stresses do become singular. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a necessary component, again, of this, of this technique. Okay. So um, what I'll show here is a quick example of uh, the, the contours. The nice thing, again, is that both of these are linear elastic based, and so they should give very similar answers. And so by looking at a contour that runs uh, through the mid-plane then of a feature, let's assume our feature has an aspect ratio of 1 to 5 or so, and you can see that the normal stress in both cases are very well, they, they collapse under the same curve, so that's good. Where by, or the barium method really sees an advantage is the fact that as we start to look at those interfaces, and particularly as we get close to that corner region, the singularities are much better incorporated by the integral solution that the boundary element possesses. And so by looking at the out-of-plane stress that's here, um, normalized by the driving force, we can incorporate these singularities in a much more tractable, tractable nature than the finite element method. So that's uh, just one thing when you're when you're evaluating uh, the merits of these various techniques that exist. And then here's just an example showing the fact that if we do a finite element analysis, uh, this is using ComSol, that we can uh, clearly see the edge relaxation, and these effects can extend again fairly far field, 15 to 20 times the film thickness. That we so now incorporating all those aspects then on the same universal curve that I showed before, uh, we can see that the finite element method uh, uh, comes pretty, uh, it, it comes very close to the distributed force analysis. And that is what we would expect for these very large features, because again, we're not impacted by that problem with very narrow features. And, and as we get down to lower values, we see something that basically spans between the two cases. Uh, so we have these two regimes that come up within our finite element modeling, and that right now it simply corresponds to an aspect ratio of something as close to the 10 that defines those two different uh, regimes. Okay, so let me go very briefly then within the next uh, few minutes to look at the different measurement techniques that exist. Uh, and there are four that I indicated earlier, I'll go through them here. Uh, wafer curvature, which again exploits the, the issue that um, the elastic relaxation between the stress film and the substrate actually deforms and bows that wafer. And so we can actually use that to infer what the in-plane stress is within our feature. 
And the resolution that we get really, and what I'm showing here is that basically the lateral resolution that these techniques exist. It's something laterally that's on the order of several millimeters, um, but we can get, in this case, because it's a force we get with, there's a certain trade-off between how thin that film is and the amount of stress that's in that film that dictates it. One of the limitations is that we assume that there's perfect adhesion between uh, the film and the substrate. Um, when we look at other techniques that are indirect in terms of the analysis of the strain, one that's uh, seen a lot of work in the past 20 years is that that's based on Raman microscopy. And one of the benefits here is that uh, you can analyze and interrogate amorphous and crystalline materials. Um, the strain resolution is, 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 is reasonable, 10 to the minus 4. But trying to access uh, systems that are much more complicated than uniaxial or biaxial becomes a bit tricky. Uh, one of the other aspects is because this is a laser-based technique, uh, you can actually heat your sample and in doing so induce a change uh, in, that, in that peak that you were interested in. So there are certain artifacts that have to be considered when you're looking at that. Uh, X-ray diffraction I mentioned earlier. Uh, there are, it spans a wide range of lateral resolution because there are different approaches. Those that involve laboratory-based systems, which can be macro beam in size, and those that look at much smaller areas. Um, the nice thing, again, is a direct measurement of the lattice spacing. It's in situ, it can be used non-destructively, and you can interrogate varied interfaces. It has, in many cases, superior strain resolution, 10 to the minus 5 or so, and depending on the application, you can have a fairly large penetration uh, one that right now uh, has been uh, the workhorse uh, looking at devices that goes based on transmission electron microscopy. And basically right now there is no com competition in terms of spatial resolution. It's clearly, it, it runs for about 20 nanometers down to 5 nanometers. And there's no other technique with lateral resolution that can compete with this. Uh, where one of its limiters is the fact that the resolution is not as good as what we can get with things like diffraction. And clearly, um, it's not possible at this point to do in situ measurements. Um, you're always going to have to uh, spend a lot of time and effort in preparing your sample. And as a result, there's going to be elastic relaxation that goes on. Uh, but depending on the application, it might be okay to look at. So I'll go through these um, fairly briefly. Um, the wafer curvature method, again, looks at the deflection that you see within your wafer. And what I'm showing here on the right uh, are examples that we get uh, from taking amorphous uh, silicon films, which have a certain residual stress on them, and then seeing the change in the deflection as we go from the center of that feature out. And uh, by doing that, we get the blanket film stress. And this is important because this is our eigenstrain again. This helps define the, the driving force in our systems. Uh, we can look at both isotropic or anisotropic materials. And what I'm showing down here is the case where if we move to a crystal orientation of our silicon substrate uh, that has a two-fold symmetry rather than a full-fold symmetry, we can actually see that effect uh, within the wafer curvature. And so we can get different amounts of bow simply due to the elastic anisotropy of the underlying structure. This is an amorphous film, and so the stress state in the film is, is isotropic, but the response that's generated within the substrate is not. Um, so we have to use the right model to, to help understand it. Um, clearly, we need a fairly large length scale, and we have the problems uh, that we've seen before. Usually, people incorporate that with the fact that we're looking at a radio asymmetric situation, uh, and depending on your substrate, that may be okay. Um, where people have started to make advances in this is looking at uh, changes to those assumptions. Uh, most importantly, to look at non-uniform curvature that you can get along the radius. And what I'm showing here is work uh, by taking finite element methods to show how, again, curvature can be changed dramatically when the assumptions of uniform film and uniform stress and even of, uh, bonding between those can change. And so Stoney's approximation here would predict a straight line where we can get some significant changes uh, in terms of that curvature depending on where you are on the wafer and the orientation of that wafer. Now, where this is seeing uh, a great application is in terms of metro metrologi metrological applications. Uh, and uh, the fact that now you can actually use this in situ within the fabrication facility to see how the deformation in your wafers uh, is being impacted by heterogeneous distributions of stress. 
Uh, and so this is important because lateral distortion uh, is becoming an increasingly, a problem, an increasingly important problem now that our lithography is led down to nanometer size dimensions in which we have to be sensitive to. And it's the fact that the, the, the sheer, the, the, the amount of uh, non-uniformity within these features here can induce significant change in your layout and can, in fact, lead to yield issues simply by the fact that you're looking at changes in residual shape that can impact um, the lithography of, of further uh, processing. And it's not the fact that you can have a wafer bow itself, uh, because very often these wafers are chucked to a tool. And so you can flatten out if the wafer curvature is uniform. You can, so you can solve for that and, and are able to counteract it. It's this uh, variation that exists here that leads to these problems that we see. And so there are ways now that exist that you can at least look at these overlay errors that occur between the registration at various levels. Okay, Raman spectroscopy I mentioned before, and the fact that we're looking at changes in the peak shift that we get from the signal uh, that are related to the stress that's distribution. Uh, there is an ability to actually exploit the polarization that exists within that incoming radiation and the exit radiation uh, to look at specific in-plane stress components. Um, it is non-destructive. Um, the wa laser wavelength can be chosen too to look at different types of penetration depths. And so if you use a UV-based uh, laser, in fact, you're much more sensitive to surface um, distributions as opposed to those that use infrared or other techniques. One of the main problems is that opaque materials uh, cannot be probed with this technique. And as I mentioned before, you can get artifacts that exist. But still, it is being used to look qualitatively at some effects. And one example that I'm showing here is the fact that a three-dimensional uh, structures and integration involve um, the incorporation of metallic conductors that exist between semiconductor substrates. And that way, you can uh, send signals and power between the stacking of different layers and come up with a more computationally efficient uh, volume. Uh, in doing so, uh, you can see that uh, there will be changes due to this uh, large metallization structure due to the mismatch in the thermal expansion that exists between a metallic structure and the uh, neighboring silicon. And so to solve this, uh, Raman has been used, but it incorporates a significant iteration between uh, the finite element modeling that's used along with the raw model measurements to get an answer, a self-consistent answer. Okay, so with the TEM-based techniques, one of the first ones that was developed probably and applied about 30 years ago was one called convergent beam electron diffraction. Uh, and for the sake of completeness, I included here, but it's really not one that's incorporated uh, that often anymore. But basically, you're looking at the Kikuchi lines that are generated. These are dynamic diffraction effects that exist because the electron beam is passing through uh, the material here. The nice thing is that through an inner fitting procedure, you can actually get a three-dimensional description of the lattice parameters in the point in the place that you're interrogating. Typically, to do this, you use a lower operating voltage of your TEM than you do for imaging. And you use thicker TEM uh, samples, and so the effects of elastic relaxation within the center of the structure are mitigated. The problem is uh, that um, because you're dealing with uh, a dynamic diffraction effect, uh, what's been seen is that the splitting of these lines uh, that are seen here has been exacerbated by the fact that when you have highly stressed samples and the fact that with a TEM sample that is basically think you can consider a slab, and that as you approach the edge of that slab, you have significantly more elastic relaxation. And so it's that non-uniform stress distribution through the thickness of the TM sample that leads to some of these artifacts that have rendered it uh, not as successful a technique. And so the two that, that I'll show um, that have been uh, very well implemented are those that utilize diffraction. So this is the analog of X-ray diffraction that I showed earlier in which we're basically rastering uh, the beam over a region of interest uh, and using the silicon substrate as our reference to tell us what uh, our unstrained values might be for the strain uh, for, the, for the system. We then see that we're just simply measuring the, the change in the position of our diffraction points. And because again, with electron diffraction, our able sphere is very large. And uh, 
and uh, the fact that uh, the TM sample, the diffraction, incorporates uh, a very large amount of diffraction in the outer plane direction, we're able to incorporate uh, the diffraction information through a variety, not just one point, but several points. And so by doing that, we can look at uh, the, uh, the, uh, the deformation within our region of interest, and if we have stressor structures, we can look at those as well. Another one that's been used um, uh, you know, very often now is by uh, incorporating the Fourier transform that we get within high-resolution electron microscopy. You can see what's going on in the, in, the, uh, in the channel region here. And what I'm plotting here is the in-plane strain that we can measure then. Um, we need to get a reference value from this sort of measurement, and so we have to go significantly far enough away from the channel to get the measurement. One of the key problems, of course, is that the strain resolution is something that is, uh, that is still needed further. Okay, uh, I think I'll, I'll go quickly to the, the end story of uh, one technique that we use to help uh, utilize uh, dark field holography. And one of the aspects was an understanding uh, of a process called stress memorization technique, in which actually by amorphizing uh, the, this, the, uh, the gate region as well as the source and channels, uh, sorry, the source and drain region, uh, and then uh, by capping the structure and then recrystallizing, we're actually changing the strain state. And you can induce significant in plane tensile strain here. And it's through the use of dark field holography that we can barely nicely see, as well as uh, electron uh, uh, microscopy, that we can see that stacking faults were actually present. And these uh, were spanned by dislocations. And we either saw perfect dislocations here at the bottom or a combination of uh, the partials that were separated by these stacking faults. But what shows up very nicely is that we can see that there is increased in-plane tensile strain that leads to the improvement in the device. Okay, I think I'll skip through diffraction topography, uh, but it is again one of the first techniques that was used to look at the deformation that exists. And because it is a dynamic diffraction effect, it's extremely sensitive to the strain. And it was something that was developed um, in the 50s uh, by Lang and others. And we can see that effects that are very far reaching were actually sensitive to those because of the fact that we have a single crystal substrate in which we're, we're analyzing. The more important effect is looking at uh, structures in which we have a finite volume uh, rather than an infinite, what can be considered a very thick silicon substrate. We can interrogate both the silicon and insulator as well as stressor regions, again, if they're crystalline. And the advantage of looking on silicon on insulator technology, in which we have a very thin silicon layer and bonded to the underlying substrate, but we can actually map the diffraction condition, and therefore the strain that's generated both independently within the silicon insulator as well as the substrate. So there are two examples I won't have time to go through, uh, but one in which that involves the embedded structures, in this case silicon carbon, on either side of our silicon and insulator channel. Um, and what we can easily do is interrogate both regions using, again, synchrotron microbean diffraction both of the channel region and the embedded stressor regions. We can also use the Escher inclusion model that I showed before to get a sense of what the amount of strain there would be in those regions. Uh, and what's amazing is that we actually get very good correspondence in these cases. Uh, for the, uh, the case of looking at the uh, silicon on insulator strain, we see a measured value of about 95% of what we would expect from these models. And that's good considering the fact that the real device has a gate on top of it, and that's not included in the model. So clearly this is appropriate for at least looking at these sorts of structures. Um, the second case that um, I won't go through, except just to show the results that we can get, is again by mapping the strain that's generated underneath these stressor structures, um, we can uh, get a very nice map of the response. And the fact that, again, by the type of model that's used, uh, we can actually get a reasonable prediction. In this case, I'm showing the results of the battery element method as well as the anisotropic edge force, you can get something that corresponds to what we see. And then just briefly, let me go through one of the key aspects here is, again, these are overlying stressor structures. And as device dimensions are decreasing, the stressor volumes are decreasing. And so therefore, we're actually marching to the left. And therefore, the amount of uh, elastic strain that we're generating in the regions of interest, which correspond to these regions here, is also decreasing. And so we have to look at new, new ways and new, uh, new geometries to help facilitate stress uh, engineering. There are other examples. 
I think I'll skip this because this leads right into our, our next talk um, by Professor Ian Robinson. But he'll show very nicely how these reconstructive techniques that are based on coherent diffractive imaging can help generate um, uh, very, uh, very uh, important information in certain, certain cases, three dimensional strain distributions that can exist. And the important thing is that the resolution that you get is no longer dictated by the incident beam size. Okay, so I think I will uh, show this picture and the fact that uh, as we're making the move now away from planar CMOS to something that is that is more three-dimensional in nature, we've heard uh, uh, some very nice talks about why that's important. Uh, one of the aspects that I want to indicate, too, is the fact that not only are short channel effects one of the problems that are leading to the move away from planar devices, but the fact that we're actually to the point where Poisson statistics are defining uh, the variation that we get in these devices. And so it's not just the fact that uh, we can manufacture these devices, but the fact that uh, it's the, the heterogeneity that we get in response that is leading the problem of maintaining uniform behavior. And by looking to these approaches that incorporate a uh, gate encapsulation, either in this case where we're wrapping around a fin type structure corresponding to the body, uh, we help to mitigate the short channel effects. But we can actually reduce some of these dopant effects by looking at fully depleted, meaning that there are no dopants at all that we intentionally push there. But the key point is that we're able to incorporate lower operating voltages. And so it's called Bolton tyranny. The fact that as we're marching on Moore's law here, we're getting to the point where we're not able to really control the devices at the power levels that we require to maintain uh, a, 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 a usable uh, device. So um, there are various techniques um, that incorporate stressors within these types of thin type structures. And really what I'll just show is this bottom point here is that the fact now that we have an extremely compliant structure, either in a fin shape or a nanowire shape, every aspect of the integration and its impact on these devices has to be incorporated to truly predict what's going on. Uh, that's true of the nanowires as well. So with that, I'll conclude. Um, it's clear that with decreasing dimensions, we have to look at these, these effects. We know that they can extend clearly very large distances, and that's to be expected from elasticity. But it's important that whatever model that we use, we recognize its limitations in terms of understanding this. Um, we have to look at the, the trade-offs and limitations among the ways in which we actually detect that strain. But it's the key aspect that there are approaches that are, that are being implemented now that aren't limited uh, by the probe size. And that with scaling, as was mentioned, it's really power that's the rate of the step here, and the and the removal of power in certain cases, rather than the lithography. Uh, and we're in the process of fighting this tyranny uh, predicted by Boltzmann, and uh, there will be many interesting applications to this. So with that, thank you. Thanks. Thanks for a nice review of this strain engineering. Uh, we have time. Let's take one or two questions. Actually, uh, are you now measuring strain also with the devices we should put in current group? Because obviously there's heating and uh, there's all kinds of uh, potential changes in the strain as you actually run the device because of electrical current grades. Yeah, yeah. Have, have, have you done such experiments? So we have not done such experiments, but yes, that's a very important point in that uh, how to do that requires a non-destructive technique. And, uh, and clearly TEM, which has been used to look at these effects, is not an option. And so we're in the process of using X-ray-based techniques to try to address that. Uh, and, uh, and I think with that, we can, we can hope to answer that in situ. Yes. Well, we, okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> let's leave this question to the coffee, and then uh, maybe we should uh, reconvene uh, at 10 past 4, is that okay? All right, so since we are a bit, a bit late, so let's, let's have, thank our speaker again. <laughs>